Hello, today I'm going to talk about prototype theory. So what is prototype theory? Well, basically it's a system of definition and um, categorization used by semanticists. A thorough understanding of prototype theory though really starts with understanding the classical model of categorization. Under the classical model, we would have a list of conditions that a particular object would need to meet in order to be categorized in a particular way. Uh, this list would be sufficient to ensure that everything that fit the uh, requirements of this object was on the list, but it would also be necessary to ensure that anything that didn't meet these requirements uh, didn't make the list. The classical model is sometimes called the Aristotelian model after the philosopher Aristotle because of its use of sufficient and necessary conditions. So to look at how the classical model works in practice, let's take a simple word like, for example, father. Under the classical model, we might offer a definition for father like male parent, um, which means that the person, or I guess animal, who is being categorised as a father needs to be both male and a parent. Everyone who fits those um, requirements will be in the category of fathers, but anyone who doesn't, because either they're not male, so mothers, or they're not a parent, so childless men, will not be categorised as fathers. So it's clearly a great system that works. Why would we need prototype theory? Well, when you dig a little deeper, you start running into problems. For example, we say male parents. Does that only include genetic parents? Um, so could adoptive fathers be fathers under this model? Or what about um, genetic um, male parents who actually aren't involved with raising their children? We don't really think of them as fathers in the traditional sense and you even hear people say about men like that he's not my father. I mean Darth Vader is technically a male parent but he's not exactly what you think of when you use the word father. In many ways it becomes even less clear how exactly words work when we're using them metaphorically. When we're talking about the founding fathers of the United States for example we're clearly not talking about them as the male parents of the United States, but the sense of the word father still seems to make sense here, yet the classical definition can't explain how we make sense of it. And all of this is actually for a word for which the classical model works comparatively well. Let's take another very common word, banana. If we're trying to define banana under the classical model of categorization, what are the sufficient and necessary conditions for something being a banana. We might say that bananas are elongated, except for those that are short. We might say that bananas are bent, except of course for those that are straight. We might say bananas are yellow, except for those that are green or brown. It's very difficult to actually come up with a list of sufficient and necessary conditions for a word like banana without getting really technical and looking at the botanical definition, which isn't really all that useful when we're trying to understand what's going on in people's heads, because most people aren't botanists. And I don't even think most botanists think that way when they're throwing together a fruit salad. Speaking of botany, that brings us to another issue with the classical model. How does it handle the difference in people's use of words and the scientific meaning of those words. For example, bananas are technically berries. Most people don't think of them that way and I very strongly suspect that most people don't even know that bananas are berries. So does that mean that if you don't know that a banana is a berry, you don't understand one of the necessary conditions for a banana, you don't know what a banana is, you don't know what you mean when you say banana? Of course not, that would be ludicrous, but it points to a gaping hole in the classical model of categorization. And it's due to problems like this that many people favour prototype theory over the classical model. Prototype theory was first proposed by American psychologist Eleanor Roche in the early 1970s. Roche did a number of experiments with the Dani people, an indigenous people in Indonesia who had a limited concept of colours and shapes before Roche um, interacted with them. Roche discovered that when the Dani people learnt to distinguish between a greater number of shapes and colours, they thought that some shades of particular colours and some forms of particular shapes were better examples than others. 
Prototype theory basically says that we have a prototype of each category in our head and we judge whether certain objects meet the requirements for membership based on how different or similar they are to that prototype. So, for example, a good prototype for a banana might be this. People might think this is what bananas look like and if something looks more similar to that then it's a banana and if it starts to look quite different from it it becomes a less typical banana until it's at the point where it's not a banana at all. This actually works quite well with bananas. For example, as you can see, we have underripe bananas. Now, we understand that these are still bananas, but they're less typical bananas. And if you asked me for a banana and I brought you this, you would probably be annoyed at me. If I brought you this, you'd think I'd gone completely mad because it's no longer similar enough to the prototype to be considered a banana, even though it's a vaguely similar shape and colour. Now, obviously, it would be nice to declare case closed and call it a day, but there are still problems here. Of course there are. For one thing, some of the prototypical effects Roche observed with colours and shapes have also been observed with things like even numbers. People seem to think that 4 is a more prototypical even number than 806, even though it doesn't make sense to say that some even numbers are more even numbery than others. And in fact, the people who made these judgments also thought it didn't make much sense when the researchers asked them about it. The late American cognitive scientist and philosopher Jerry Forder pointed out that there were other problems with prototype theory around the issue of compositionality. Basically, the issue of compositionality is that we make sentences up by composing them out of words. And these words can come together to have a particular meaning, which they don't have independently. But prototype theory doesn't really allow for that. It says that there's a prototype for every category. And one of the big issues that this brings up is the issue of negation, when we say something isn't there. Foda called this issue the uncat problem. So not a cat is obviously a category that exists because some things aren't cats. But if it's a category, prototype theory says it ought to have a prototype. So what's the prototype for not a cat? Um, well, Photo says, of course, you could solve this by just picking something and saying that's the prototype for not a cat, like, for example, bananas. But that has a very odd consequence, as Photo points out. It implies that the less anything is like a cat, the more it's like bananas. But then there are clearly things out there in the world that are neither cats nor bananas. Like books, for example. Clearly neither a cat nor a banana is a good prototype for a book. But the situation we've just set up has forced us into a dichotomy where books are somehow like bananas. The other problem that Foda points to is the pet goldfish problem, which is that a goldfish is neither a prototypical fish, you might think of something more like trout or salmon, and it's not a prototypical pet, you might think of a dog or a cat, but it is the prototypical pet fish, which suggests that understanding the word pet and understanding the word fish isn't sufficient for understanding what a pet fish is, even though it clearly is. Similarly, going back to the word father, George Washington is not a prototypical father, he had no children, and the United States isn't the prototypical nation, it's far more heterogeneous than most nations. And yet, of course, George Washington is the prototypical father of the nation. Ultimately, despite the popularity of prototype theory, it still has some problems when it's actually applied to the language. Um, and this could mean a variety of things. Maybe it means that some of our intuitions about the language are incorrect. Maybe um, it means that a single unified theory can't explain all of language. Or maybe it means that theory does exist and it's out there somewhere, but we haven't happened upon it yet. Nevertheless, it's important to understand prototype theory to understand semantics.